on this edition of Stay Relevant. She's put out an internet manifesto on what it means to be a durable human. Now, former ABC News producer J.J. Madden has written a new book and wants to chat it up. What's it all about? Why is it relevant to you? And what's it got to do with fresh baked bread? That was revolutionary. Hang on, because here it comes. It's one small step for man. Two, one. Everything is going. Welcome to Stay Relevant, my wandering conversations with interesting people. I'm Mike Cibola. My guest today is author and multimedia producer Jennifer Joy Madden, also known as JJ. Welcome, JJ. Thank you, Mike. Glad to be here. And I work with you kind of in your ABC News days or right after that. Mm-hmm. You, you have a long history of uh, broadcast work with ABC News. How did you get here? After I left ABC, I became a freelancer. So that's when I started to work with you. You know, I was thinking about what happened and where we've all come from. And I think that we've all been touched and we've had to morph and vamp with the changes in technology. So really that's what happened to me and that's how I could be working with editors and shooters and reporters at ABC News and then sort of doing all that by myself right now online. So your brand over the past few years is uh, The Durable Human. Your website is Mm -hmm. durablehuman.com. And uh, you have a Durable Human manifesto, a new book that is out, Mm -hmm. um, which we'll talk about in a little while. But what's uh, what's that all about? How did you come up with The Durable Human um, and what prompted you with that? Well, while I was working, I was also raising a family. And um, my oldest child, I brought her up in the pre-internet days. And I saw how she grew and developed, and she had a broad range of interests. And she, um, you know, she explored around as a little kid and got into a lot of things. Um, my last child was born 10 years later. This was after the introduction of the internet. He was uh, experiencing the world in a different way. And the screens were very attractive to him, as they were to the rest of us, because we bought them. And so, but what, ha- what I was seeing was that he was not looking outside as much as my daughter was. And you mentioned that, you mentioned that in the, the manifesto. Yeah. Uh, um, that's a big point, growing up BC or before cell phone. Right, last the generation whole, BC. Yeah, and, and, it, and you, you raise a good point in there. You talk about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak about, uh, you know, if they were here today, if they were creating today, would they still come up with that idea of, of, the, of the computer? Because, because uh, curiosity and boredom went hand in hand with creativity, it fueled creativity, and you looked outside of other than, you know, you had to come up with your own resources. You had to figure it out. Um, and that seems like this whole thing developed from that. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, I would say, the, the, and the, another point I make in the manifesto about Jobs and Wozniak is that uh, if they were little, if they were little, would their stray thoughts be usurped by, you know, a video game or some game on somebody's iPhone? And I worry about kids having their wild ideas sort of squelched or sort of uh, eliminated by having to use, by always using other people's ideas, which are really the fun games and things that they can do on their technology. So ultimately what happened was I figured out, after struggling with this last generation before cell phones concept, that, um, that there was an opportunity cost to being on these devices all the time. It really took me a number of years to figure it out and being rejected by some agents and publishers by, uh, for the last generation BC concept because they thought at that time writing a, uh, publishing a book on technology was very risky. They didn't want to do it because technology changed so fast and the book would be null and void by the time it was printed. But, we your, ha- but your book, uh, yeah. It sounds like your concept, though, isn't about technology. It's about the overarching effects of technology. Yeah. It totally, and it, and it applies, it, it would have applied 10 years ago as much as it does today. In fact, more today. <laughs> it's not it based took, on specific technology, though. Yeah. Right, and so it took me that long to figure it out. So then that's what it was. That's exactly what it was, is that we have this wonderful technology, but we, we have to be consciously using it. 
Otherwise, it can overwhelm us and take away our good stuff and, and step on our good ideas and that might have developed, especially in children. And so that's a real, the essence of the manifesto is that little, little kids should explore the world with all their senses, get to know their own operating systems before you introduce the other ones. I'm going to ask you about being a thought leader. That's something that you mentioned in, in some of your materials. What What is a thought leader? I've seen the buzzwords. It sounds like a buzzword, but what, what exactly does it, does it mean? It sounds like something you hear in church. Jonathan uh, Fields is, is the first person, is why I wrote the manifesto. He gave me the idea for the manifesto. A manifesto is a short declaration of beliefs. And it's a way to put out a book pr fairly quickly that isn't very long. And... Um, and so what Jonathan was talking about is if you come up with some original ideas and you decide that you want to put them out there, you are a thought leader. You're leading with new thoughts, I mean, as in simply put. And so uh, it took me a few years to... to Come up you with know. new thoughts? And no, just to admit <laughs> that maybe I'd be a thought leader because it does sound pretty haughty or something like that. But a little pretentious. A little pretentious. Sometimes. So that's why I don't really write it down and call myself a thought leader, but I like it when other people call me thought leaders. There's a lot of things... LinkedIn, you... LinkedIn is good at that. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. They'll say, hey, you look like... You join this thought leader or you can become a thought leader. I think they actually have a, a way where you can officially become a thought leader. That, that's LinkedIn lingo, yes. I don't know how it's... <laughs> Recognized internationally, or if you get a badge or whatever. <laughs> no badges. No badges. It's all mental. And that self-publishing with a manifesto led you to start what you call artisanal publishing. What exactly is that? It's everything except the fresh bread smell. I mean, I wish there was some food associated with artisanal publishing, but there isn't. Uh, yeah, so what happened was... Um, I was in on this whole transition. I was trying to write this story early on, Last Generation B.C., and uh, that was in the probably, it was in the late, it was around 2008. But right around that time, the whole publishing industry blew up because of Amazon, basically, and the Internet and the ability to self-publish. So self-publishing was going on then, but it was, was used to be called vanity publishing. Right. People would write about their, you know, their life story or something and then have it printed and print like 20 copies and their family would buy it and they, that would be our vanity publishing. Well, with Amazon and the tools that were available, people could start writing legitimate literature on the internet and not have to have a traditional publisher. But you've taken it to the next, the next step, it sounds like, because you know anybody could do that and you know kind of mm -hmm. throw something out there. But it sounds like you're working with professionals who used to be in the traditional um, architecture of publishing and who have pretty accomplished individuals and you have tapped into that and and put a network together where you're able to offer that through your artisanal publishing company. Right. And so that's the whole thing. So yeah. traditional publishing falls apart. People go out into the world as freelancers, hang out their shingle. Writers go, okay, wow, I pay some dollars. It's not cheap. But you get them, and then you get a product that, that is as good as something you can get done in New York at one of the houses. Let's talk about media for a moment. It's a uh, democratizing platform, the Internet. Now, anybody, and the cost of technology coming down, now anybody can make a video, put it online, and you know it can go viral. But I think what actually is happening, that happens sometimes, but what's happening is that there's just more noise to cut through. It used to be in the old days, there were three or four networks. You tuned into the networks. It was hard to get on the networks to, get, to be seen. Well, now it's easy to get on the networks, which is the Internet, but it's still hard to be seen because there's so much of it out there. So we're kind of where we were before. It's just that everybody's doing it now. I kind of brought that up because you're actually, um, you teach digital journalism in your grad school coaching. And do you find uh, that to be a problem? Do you, ever, do you ever run up against that or is that something you talk about? I'm involved in a summer program here in Washington, D.C. Um, that is run by the, uh, it's part of the grad program of the Newhouse School of Public Communications of Syracuse University. And I always tell them, you are amazing people because you are now doing yourself what it took at least three professionals to do at ABC News now. Um, if you could see these students going around town on the metro dragging their case, their camera case, and their tr sticks, their tripod, 
and going and shooting, setting up. They set their lights. They do their microphone. They come back. They edit everything. And then we go down in a booth and we record. And they basically have done the whole thing themselves. And they are fast. They're thoughtful. And they make me feel more optimistic about the future that these people can be so um, organized and, um, you know, professional in the way they're going about their business doing three people's jobs. Well, it's a new, I think it's like, I don't want to say it's a new paradigm. It's a, it's a different paradigm because it's been around for a little while. But um, I think we lose maybe some of the creativeness that other people would bring to the story. Trying to do everything yourself, um, not having other people to work with, to bounce ideas off of, to to kind of to collaborate with. Isn't that also part of what creativity is all about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a cost to it, uh, but there still is. There still should be editors and news directors involved. So there's still that part of it, that the people aren't completely isolated. They're working with others. When you get to a TV station, um, when they're lucky, they get to work with an editor. So there is still some of that going on, for sure. And hopefully even in an organization where you have these multimedia journalists embedded, like in a magazine, for instance, that they have to, they still have to work with the editors. I mean, talking about the editors, meaning the, the people that are making the decision editorially. Uh, so there's, there's still a lot of creativity involved. So where do you see it going from here? What's the next big jump? Oh, man. Uh, you know, virtual reality. My son is a designer in uh, Portland, Oregon, and he was involved in the North Face campaign. The retail design for their new stores was based on a documentary where these really, really adept skiers and journalists were videotaping the climb and then coming down the mountain. So the whole thing was about that. And so you, you had to have this whole gestalt of this crazy, beautiful mountain. Um, Vista had to be part of the campaign and all that stuff. So as part of that, there was a virtual reality ability for somebody to kind of put on a headset and be there, you know, to go to the village on the mountain and see it all and all that stuff. So that's a super positive way of um, looking at virtual reality is that we can step inside a world that we couldn't visit otherwise. As far as being a durable human is concerned, I mean, I don't, I could, we could talk another hour about what is happening to the human body when they're sort of sitting in these environments. Probably not much physiologically is going on except you get scared. There's a fight or flight response, things like that. But as far as, uh, yes, okay, all right, you get up and move around a little bit, but uh, possibly but I, I think there's a lot of other things that maybe we're not accessing when we're in that virtual reality environment. But that is yet to be determined. But I'm an advocate of real life um, and that we have to keep um, a balance between that. And that's a good point, um, just because you mentioned, oh, well, you know, with all this technology and all these advances, robots and automation you know, are these robots going to take over someday? Well, I am yeah. printing up a new T-shirt as we speak, and on the front it says "Hooray for Humans," and in the and here it says "Hooray for Humans" in the manifesto because it's like people wake up. I mean, we really have to be advocating for ourselves now. We can't just, you know, bend over and let it happen. You know, it's like we have to really take charge of our future. Otherwise, it's going to take charge of us for sure. A lot of our functions are being performed by robots and machines now. Um, it's progress. But what that means is that we have to understand what is it about ourselves, our human species, that sets us apart from machines. We have to understand what it is and then we got to make we got to make it shine. And so that's what I mean by being durable. So what we have on machines is our senses but not just those five, because they can listen and feel and things like that. But we have ingenuity, we have curiosity, um, we have compassion, we have feelings. And so what we need to do is keep those uh, in the forefront and keep them and understand our beautiful sense of touch and how we can communicate with a glance. And we have got a lot of advantages over machines.
And it's, I'm afraid it's time that we actually have to notice and not take them for granted and, not make, sh and make sure that they're not dampened or sort of superseded by our, um, our technology tools. They're tools. They're not bosses of us. Right. I feel like I have a handle on the technology because I feel like I'm grounded, you know, in my own curiosity and my own ability to use my brain to figure things out. Um, um, so I can see where you're going with that. And it seems like that's kind of what led to your book, which is uh, how to be a durable human, revive and thrive in the digital age through the power of self-design. That's a long title. Yep. But it's again, it's, a, it's a, the durable human theme. And it sounds like one of the key points is the glow. How much of an effect did that have on your writing this book? Or is it just a small point? Uh, no, I think, I think it's, it's an important piece of having a balanced life and protecting your, yourself, the good stuff about you. And what I did realize is after I'd read some other people's books about um, the transmission that goes on between your cell phone and the cell towers, that there's, there's actually um, electromagnetic you know, waves coming out from it. Uh, just as if you stood by a cell phone tower, they'd be there too. Our brains are also bioelectrical. That's how our nerves are conducted. Our nerve impulses are conducted by electrical impulses. And so therefore, it makes a lot of sense, actually, that putting a very powerful device that's doing, you know, transmission next to your own brain, you know, just separated by the skull is not can cause some interference. And so it's just a matter of, no, there's no direct connection between your cell phone and cancer. That's not what I'm talking about. I think it's a matter of, um, as Apple says in there, to put at least a half inch of space there, simply because of the physical reason is that you have two transmitting devices and we don't want them to interfere. So that's kind of what I call the glow. And I, that's why I use the term glow that I made up to have people visualize, yeah, there's a little glow around your phone. It's not a great idea to have it pressed against your body, either your abdomen, your, um, your brain, or in your front pockets of your pants. You talk about self-design in here. How, do, how does that play a part? And what, what does that, um, what do you mean by that? So you have a lot of um, listeners who are into um, designing websites or video or writing scripts. So what you're doing is you're making conscious, conscious choices to tell a story. And so your life is kind of like that. You want to tell your story well. And so therefore, to enable yourself to display, you know, your good ideas and, and what you want to communicate, you need to um, not, you need to make good choices about yourself. So you want to get good sleep. And therefore, you don't necessarily want to be looking at an unprotected screen, a screen that's blowing out the blue light um, right before you go to sleep because it interrupts with sleep, your sleep. So therefore, you make a decision in your life. You consciously make a decision. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be wise about how you, I might use my devices. So I guess that's what I mean about self-design. Let's say you've got um, a toddler around the house. And the toddler is very attracted to your devices that are around, and they and sometimes you you know they use them you know to play a game or something like that. Well, if you don't want your child to be caught up in the device and you want them to have a balanced life, put the iPad in a drawer or up on a shelf so the kid can't see them, so it doesn't become an issue. So you can help your child be balanced and be playing with uh, blocks, and then when you want them to they can play with an iPad. That's the kind of design I'm talking about. Really actual steps that you take in your own life to design a durable life. One of the other things that, that struck me about the book was that you set up this, the premise from the beginning is that we're all special. Um, that the chance of ever existing is like near zero if you kind of look at you know how our ancestors weren't... Uh, didn't die. They were able to meet each other and, and mate. They didn't die. They weren't eaten by some animal. So you need to take care of yourself. You need to, you know, you need, you, we're all special, no matter who we are, where we are. And that seems like that's where this book is coming from. So all this information is kind of pointed at that. That, I guess, is an important, is an important point. Um, and so what were you trying to do with that? Uh, I am trying to have people appreciate their lives. Now, people have been philosophers and others have been trying to do that forever, to have people be conscious of themselves and the really unique aspects of themselves. 
Um, and so that's an important piece. But I also am trying to help people understand their own humanity. And the other thing that's in there that we haven't even talked about at all is that we're human animals. And this is another thing that we have to realize about ourselves is that we, um, we are of nature. We're of nature. And we have been, we have evolved in an, a bioelectrical environment, which is the weather of the storms and the wind and all that stuff. Um, and in association with the outdoors and with other creatures. And that there are many things about ourselves that are fed by being outside in nature. See, I would have thought um, that, you know, we as a human being, or are all species, it, we evolve. Mm -hmm. One could argue that we're, we're, we, we evolve, and therefore, if we're putting all this junk into our bodies, our bodies can just adapt. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going outside, well, we just adapt. Our eyes change to, you know, to, to work with the environment we're working with. Um, you know, we, we, um, we're working on computer screens all day, so our eyes will adapt to that. Our bodies adapt to sitting around all day. I mean... What you're saying, though, is yes, they adapt, but they don't really adapt. They just kind of change and they turn into a big blob and, 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 you're, <laughs> and you get sick and you get unhealthy. There's evolving, there's adapting. And so, yes, the putting on weight and things like that is kind of adapting in, this, in the present sense. But evolving takes genetic changes over time. And so, therefore, yeah, sure, we're going to be changing over time, over, over generations. We are going to change because of our associating with technology. So. I think it's a good note to end on. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of good information. Jennifer Joy Madden, JJ, is an author and multimedia producer. Her website is durablehuman.com um, and a soon-to-be published website, australarc.com. And uh, her new book is called How to Be a Durable Human. It'll be available on Amazon as well as your website, I'm sure. Right. And if they go to my website, they can actually download the ebook of the Durable Human Manifesto for free. Right. Okay, great. And that was my next thing. The, for the free ebook, the uh, Durable Human Manifesto, which is uh, actually uh, it's, uh, it's a quick read. It's worth it. Great talking with you. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. The podcast is Stay Relevant, Wandering Conversations with Interesting People. Original music by Popmark Media on the web at popmarkmedia.com. See and hear more on my website at mikesabola.com. Until next time, try and stay relevant.